the black With Marcus Benjamin I'm Marcus Benjamin. Yeah, it's me. Welcome to Living in the Black. And guess what? The entire month of May, we're talking about money. Yep, the entire month of May, we're talking about money. I know there are some people who don't want to hear about money. They're like, oh, no, don't tell me what I'm doing wrong. But then there are other people out there who are saying, let's talk about it. Let's get into it. Let's dig into it because I want to know how to handle it better, how to manage it better, how to fulfill God's purpose with it. I want to know as much as I can about money, et cetera. Yeah, those are the ones I'm talking to right there. I want you to like. I want you to share this message. No, listen, I need for you to share this message because there are people right now in your social network who need to understand the power of money, how to get it, how to manage it, etc. And that's what we're talking about the entire month of May. So listen, let everybody know right now that living in the black is on. Life has deficits. So listen, we're talking about money in May. Now, uh, let me go and just throw this out at you. I love talking about money. I love talking about leadership. I love talking about business. I love talking about the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit. I love talking about faith. And <laughs> why am I bringing all those things up? Because they are all connected to money. They're all connected to finance and resource and revenue. And God has no problem with money. God has no issues with money at all. But let me begin by telling you just a quick backstory. You know, I grew up in a context where money was scarce. I grew up in a context where having more than enough rarely happened. I grew up in a situation where my parents were good people, uh, good people, but they lacked understanding in certain areas of money. And unfortunately, we lived in a particular uh, environment that did not support economic understanding. It didn't support uh, money management. It just didn't support it. Did, there weren't resources available, et cetera. So as a result, we typically, we experienced the consequence of living in a rural uh, area that was overrun by poverty and insufficiency. And as a result, we grew up impoverished. You know, it was just a challenge. You know, we experienced government aid on many occasions for food and uh, for clothing and for housing, et cetera. So we lived and grew in a context of insufficiency. And we went to church. Yeah, we went to church uh, when, we, when I was younger. We went to church uh, irregularly, uh, you know, the major holidays we did. And as we got a little older, my mom you started sending us to church a little bit more, a little bit more frequently. And uh, even in church, we didn't hear messages of economic empowerment, financial empowerment. We didn't hear messages of God's plan for our money. We didn't hear messages about faith and prosperity and productivity. We just didn't hear that. We heard uh, a better day is coming. We heard uh, in the by and by. We heard survival, et cetera. And I'm not hating on the churches that I grew up uh, being a part of, et cetera. But all I'm saying is, is that we typically did not hear solid, clear teaching on money, on finance, on productivity and prosperity. And I don't hold that against uh, those churches when I was small uh, because you can only teach what you know. Now, certainly we all have a responsibility to grow, to learn and to serve. But again, during that era in the in the early 80s and the mid 80s, it just didn't happen in South Carolina. But I'm thankful that God began to give me a revelation. I'm thankful that as I got older and I got saved and uh, was filled with God's spirit, I began to understand from the word of God that God had a plan for my prosperity. He had a plan for my productivity. He had a plan for, for the increase of resources 
in my life. And hopefully you will benefit from my story. You'll benefit from my experiences. You will benefit from this revelation that I have in the area of money and finances, and it will change your life forever. So right now, you know, there are, there are three positions you can be in right now, uh, financially speaking. You can be in a deficit, you can be in a break even, or you can be in a surplus. You can be in the red, you can be in the gray, you can be in the black. God's plan is for you to be in the black. His plan is for you to have more than enough. His plan is for you to have sufficiency and increase over and above your expenses and the demands of life. Yeah, that's God's plan. It's always been God's plan. It's never been God's plan for some people to be poor and for other people to be well off or rich. It's never been God's plan for some people to have more than enough while other people just struggled. I mean, think about it for a second. Who would God decide to be poor? I mean, if we were all created in God's image and after his likeness, as the word of God declares, then who would he decide that has his image and that has his likeness, and I'm gonna decide for them to be poor. No, poverty and riches, or more than enough, is the consequence of choices and context. We're gonna deal with that you know, over this month, choices and context. And choices and context, in many instances, aren't because God chose them or because God created them, it's because people created them. People make choices and people create context. And as a result of that, there are people who have more than enough, there are people who have just enough, and there are people who don't have enough. But you have to make a decision that I am called to be in the group of people who have more than enough. You see, you have to make that decision. No one else can make that decision for you. You can't wait for a politician to make that decision for you. You can't wait for the government to make that decision. You can't wait for your preacher to make that decision. You have to make that decision for yourself that it is God's will for me to have more than enough. It is God's will for me to be prosperous. It is God's will for me to be productive. Nobody else can make that decision for you but you. You can't look to anybody else. You can't, you can't get permission from anybody else. You must get permission from the image of God that is on the inside of you that I am called to have more than enough because God's image is upon me. I'm created in his image and after his likeness. And as a result of that and that alone, I am worthy to have more than enough. Listen, not because I'm a male, not because you're a female, not because you're a part of a certain cultural group, not because you live in a certain nation or country. I don't care what country you live in. The essence of why you are called to prosper is founded upon one thing and one thing alone. You are created in God's image and after God's likeness. Let me read that to you. It's found in Genesis chapter one, verse 28. And God blessed mankind and said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, over the creeping thing and everything that moves upon the earth. So let's think about that. You were created in God's image and after God's likeness. I was created in God's image and after God's likeness. No matter what country I'm in, as a matter of fact, you remember Jeremiah chapter one, verse five, God said to Jeremiah, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. So God knew you before you were born to be a certain gender. God knew you before you were born to be a part of a certain culture. God knew you before you were born to, be, to live in a certain nation, he knew you. And if he knew you, before all of that, did he plan for you to be poor? Did he plan for you to have just enough? Or did he plan for you to prosper, be productive, and have more than enough? I think the answer is pretty clear. He planned to prosper you and to give you more than enough. Let me read a scripture to you, another one. This is Jeremiah chapter, one, chapter 29. It says this, For I know the faults that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you hope and a future. Notice what it says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. He said, and I want you to, I want you to check this out, verse 11. 
thoughts of peace, not of evil. Now that word peace there doesn't just mean tranquility. It doesn't mean, you know, laying around and having, you know, water flow off rocks and the birds, you know, chirping away and the wind blowing and flowers, you know, blowing past you. That's not what the word peace means in the Bible. <laughs> in the Bible, the word peace in most instances is the Hebrew word shalom. And it literally means wholeness. It literally means, literally means completeness. It literally means prospering. That when people said peace be unto you, they were saying what? Prosperity prosperity be unto you. They were saying blessing be unto you. They were saying be strong. They were saying be accomplished. They were saying be productive. That's what the word peace means. God said, I have plans of peace for you, not of evil, to give you hope and a future. You see, that's what God knows about you. That's what he knew about you before you were born. That's what he knew about you before you made financial decisions, before you were born in a certain country and around certain people. He knew that about you. So you have to make a decision that I'm called to be prosperous and productive because I am made in the image of God. You see, when I grew up, I'm not quite sure if we really understood that we were created and made in God's image. Because we lived in a cultural context where as a black person, you know, you weren't esteemed, you weren't valued, you weren't prized, you weren't exalted, uh, you weren't uh, dignified. Uh, you were uh, considered average or below. Uh, you were considered worthy to be taken advantage of. And you didn't have much education. Uh, you, you lived in communities that in most cases were filled with people just like you who were barely making it or not making it. And as a result, the community did not support the fact that black people had great value and great significance. Now, again, I know when people are hearing that, they say, Mark, are you talking bad about your community like that? No, I'm just saying that's what it was. That's factual. That is what transpired. That is what, th that is the system in which I was raised under. And as a result of that, you know, my parents didn't make the best of financial choices uh, in school in terms of education and so forth. My mother graduated high school, but didn't go any further than that. Uh, my father didn't graduate high school. Uh, as a matter of fact, he dropped out in about the ninth grade, if I remember correctly. So there were certain situations that they put themselves in because of uh, their own choices. But remember, there were two, there are two attributes. You have choice and then you have context. Remember, I mentioned that earlier. You see, those were their choices, but the broader context in which they were living in was one where black people weren't celebrated, weren't promoted, weren't expected to do much, and they were expected to simply be farmers, to be sharecroppers, and to take the piecemeal handouts that was given to them by others. That was the context in which uh, they were raised and the context in which most uh, of my you know, upbringing you know, was, was in. So as a result, my mentality was shaped by the choices of my parents and the context in which we were raised. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is where the great problem lies. We need people who are born again and filled with the spirit to disrupt the choices that were made before them and to disrupt the context in which they were nurtured and raised in. And that disruption happens because of the image of God. Oh, man, you got to get that. That the disruption happens when you begin to understand that you were created and made in God's image and in God's likeness. And if you were created and made in God's image and, and God's likeness, that means creativity is in you. That means innovation and ingenuity is in you. The spirit of you can accomplish, you can overcome, you can attain is within you. The spirit of adding value to people, the spirit of not being consumed and controlled by what you buy and what you can have, but what you can accumulate and what you can distribute. You see, all these things begin to rise up within you when you and I begin to understand that we are created in God's image and after God's likeness. Now, let me be very clear. I'm not trying to throw shade on my parents. I, I love my mom. My dad is no longer alive. My mom is uh, doing well and so forth. But I'm just trying to explain to you a context that's very important because most people, because they never address the choices of the people who came before them or the context in which they were nurtured, they never really break through mentally uh, in the area of productivity and prosperity. 
and even people of faith, people who give offerings and sow seeds and people who receive prophetic words about finance and accomplishment and attainment, they still struggle with those uh, those mental hindrances, you know, they struggle with the unconscious mind. If some of you remember, uh, I was talking about that a lot in the month of April about, you know, the, the, where the instincts come from. And there are many people who have instincts that are contradictory to prosperity. They have instincts that are contradictory to productivity. They have instincts that are contradictory to the will and purpose of God manifesting in their finances because they haven't addressed the choices in the context in which they were raised. You see, uh, a, a buddy of mine tells a story of one of his mentors that he visited, you know, many years ago. And when he visited one of his mentors, who was a, a very wealthy uh, business person, and the mentor's son was having private soccer lessons by one of the greatest uh, soccer coaches during that time. And he asked his, asked his mentor, well, what's that all about? And he was like, well, my son wants to play uh, soccer for our country's national team. And as a result, you know, we hired the best soccer, you know, instructor to coach him privately, you know, here um, at, our, at our home. And so he began to think for a moment about the opportunity that that young son was afforded because his father had experienced massive productivity and massive business success. And think about that for a second. That young man getting private lessons at his home by one of the best soccer instructors uh, of that time. What kind of context does that young man have? What kind of default instincts does that young man develop? What does that young man begin to think about himself and his life because of that experience? Does that make sense? I'm trying to paint the picture for you as to why many people never really break through to massive financial success. Why many people, sincere, godly people, love Jesus people, give tithes, give offerings, I mean, sow seed, bless their pastors and so forth. Why they never break through to massive success is because they haven't addressed the faculty of choice and the faculty of context because those things affect your default instincts. They defect your default way of approaching money and productivity and prosperity. And you and only you can decide how much intentionality you need to devote to the word of God and to studying and learning to divorce yourself from those mentalities and those attitudes that impede your economic progress. Now, let me give you another scripture. This is uh, Romans uh, chapter 12. Uh, most of you are familiar with this passage if you've been reading the scriptures. But I want to, again, read it to you. It's, this is what uh, Paul said in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 down to uh, verse 2. I urge you, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you may discern or prove what is the good, the acceptable and the perfect will of God. Now, now what am I saying here? Listen to what the scripture gives us a very strong uh, admonition. Paul says, I urge you. He says, I'm begging you basically to be transformed. I'm begging you to have your mind go through an overhaul. I'm begging you that in the areas of life regarding the kingdom of God, you have to have a mental upgrade, a mental renovation. Are you feeling what I'm saying? I need for you to grasp this because see, choice and context affect your default settings, <laughs> you know, your default settings, your default instincts as it relates to money and economic success. And as a result, if you don't address choice and context, if your mind isn't renewed, then you'll find yourself shouting over God's word of prosperity. You'll find yourself knowing that you can be prosperous, knowing that you can have more than enough, but never ever really breaking through to massive financial success. And it's because your instincts will kick in, your default instincts from your parents, your default instincts from your context will kick in and they will direct your choices and it will direct you away from manifestation. 
I'm telling you what I know. You know, as I, you know, uh, grew up and I went to college and I had a gr broader exposure of finances and economics and so forth and started working for the bank and ultimately went into private banking, dealt with people who made $90,000 a month, $100,000 a month, $200,000 a month. And I'm, I'm dealing with these people and interacting with them. I found out that the, the vast majority of them didn't have book smarts. Yeah, the vast majority of, of, of them I was smarter than at 21 years old, at 22 years old. I had more book smarts than them at 23 years old. But their money was a thousand times greater than mine, a hundred times greater than mine. And I began to understand that although my book knowledge was important, they had a different kind of knowledge that I didn't have. They had an economic knowledge. They understood they understood how money worked. They understood how money moved. They understood how currency flowed. They understood how to position themselves within a market to have access to uncommon revenue and income. They understood how to make professional choices and business choices with money to position themselves for massive financial success. And I didn't understand that. I didn't understand that world. I told you about the world I grew up in. I didn't understand that world. I had accumulated book knowledge, but my book knowledge was trumped by their, not their street knowledge, but their money knowledge, their understanding of money. And there's so many people right now listening to me. You're a believer. You love Jesus. You pray in tongues. You worship God. You're going to heaven, but your money knowledge doesn't grow. Every year, your money knowledge stays the same. Your economic knowledge stays the same. And, and you're not understanding that money doesn't happen just because you receive a prophecy. Money doesn't come to you in massive numbers just because you give a tithe or an offering. There's a way you have to learn how to think about money after you sow. There's a way you have to learn how to think about money after you give. You, does that make sense? There's a way that you have to approach your life after you give that, that significant seed. You can't just sit around and say, well, I believe God's going to do it. Yes, God's going to do it. But a part of that responsibility is his and the other part of that responsibility is yours. So the Apostle Paul says to us, he said, be what? Transformed by the renewing, the renewing, the renovating of your mind. So right now, what areas of money do you need to be transformed? What areas of finances do you need to have an overhaul in? What areas of choice and context? Because right now, right now, you are a candidate for immense financial promotion. You are a candidate for immense economic growth. But being a candidate doesn't make it a reality. Being a candidate doesn't make it happen. Doesn't make it happen. There are certain things you and I have to do. There are things that you and I have to learn. There are things that you and I have to apply to experience massive financial success. And I'm gonna to talk to you about that stuff all month. Listen, all month of May, you're not gonna have an excuse when May is over. <laughs> you may have had an excuse in April and March and you know, in February and January, but you're not going to have an excuse when May is over because May, we're talking about money and we're giving you permission to prosper, permission to be productive. But it starts with the way you think. Romans chapter 12. Verse two, be transformed so you can discern. You see, discernment has to do with your instincts. It has to do with your ability to see clearly and understand. It has to do with your ability to know what to do, when to do it. Does that make sense? You, you, you have to discern. You have to know. You can't, you can't claim ignorance anymore. You can't claim God's just going to do it and you don't grow and learn and enhance yourself. Those days are over. Do you feel what I'm saying? So let's go back to the book of Genesis as we deal with this context of God's plan for your finances. So we looked at chapter one where God gave you his image. And I told you that's the key issue. That's the key issue. Listen, if you, let's just say, for instance, you forget everything, everything I'm going to talk about in May. If you major on that one, the Holy Ghost will teach you the rest. He'll give you the insight for the rest because you will begin to understand that because you're made in God's image and after God's likeness, having just enough it's just, it's just not the will of God. Having not enough, it's just not the will of God. This is not the plan of God. Let's look at another one. Genesis chapter 12, verse two. This is God talking to Abraham. And I will make of thee a great nation, 
and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you shall be a blessing. So God told Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to cause you to be a blessing. I'm going to bless you. This is what God was saying to Abraham. He's saying, this is what I want to do for you. This is what I'm going to do for you. This is what my will is for you. Yeah, he says, this is it. Now, Abram didn't convince God to say these things about him. Abram didn't send God an email, say, hey, say some favorable things about me. No, of God's own volition, he said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great. I want you to be a blessing. And if God is saying that of his own will toward Abraham, what do you think he's saying about you? So listen, in this month's episodes, we're talking about money and I'm going to come back next week and I'm going to show you how, listen, how Abram's message, how what God said to Abram is just as applicable as God talking to you himself. As a matter of fact, that when he was talking to Abraham, he was talking to you and to me at the exact same time. Listen, come back next week. I'm going to show you how true that is from the word of God. We're in May and we're exploring possibilities in money. God bless you. Have you heard of being in the red? It is used in finance to mean being overextended, overdrawn, or having a deficit. But now, being in the red covers much more than money. People are in the red in their relationships, physical and emotional health, knowledge, and even in their faith. Have you experienced any of these deficits? Are you currently in or at the brink of being in the red? More than ever before, Christians are looking for answers to eliminate the deficits in their life. The Living in the Black Tour features award-winning speaker, leadership expert, and author Marcus Benjamin. Congregations across the country are raving, inspiring, spiritual and strategic, truly transforming experience, a powerful message with strategies to eliminate deficits and experience authentic surplus, inspiration to reach for God's best in the five gray spaces, and a live Q&A. Living in the Black Tour coming to a city and church near you, living in the Black Tour, erasing deficits, encountering Jesus, enhancing lives. It's time to get out of the red and into the black. I'm Marcus Benjamin, the host of Living in the Black, one of the fastest growing shows in Christianity that's airing right here on Dominion TV. And for those of you who don't catch it live, also on our YouTube channel. I want you to make sure you dial in with us in the month of June because I've got two guests coming to be with me who are going to really bless you. Doctors Carla and Rob Robinson of Urban House Call. They're gonna be talking about faith, health, and divine healing from a kingdom of God perspective. You don't want to miss this. We're talking about getting your summer body in shape, talking about getting your whole life in shape, talking about getting your health ready to go to fulfill God's will for your life. Make sure you tune in all month of June as I have doctors Carla and Rob Robinson discussing faith, healing, and health from a kingdom of God perspective. You will be transformed. Make sure you tune in the month of June. Black, with Marcus Benjamin.